Happy Monday, everybody. My name is Patrick Hess, your planetarium specialist. This is my assistant, Phoebe, who's uh, working very hard on chewing on my coat. And thanks for tuning in to another planetarium live stream. We are back this lovely and chilly Monday night uh, after our change of schedule last week. For those of you uh, who joined us last week for the stream, I hope you enjoyed that. We did our stream on a Sunday night last time uh, because we were covering the... Uh, the uh, eclipse, or no, it's not the eclipse, rather the conjunction, uh, the great conjunction of uh, Jupiter and Saturn that happened uh, last Monday, which I was, uh, of course, outside of my telescope to see. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if you did uh, tune into last week's stream uh, on Sunday, let us know if you're here watching this uh, Monday, and don't forget that we are live, so if you have any questions or comments or just want to say hi, uh, like Phoebe is saying hi, right now, then uh, be sure to uh, drop uh, drop a message in the comments. We've already got Vanessa tuning in, saying hello. Thanks for watching, Vanessa. Um, and this will be our final live stream of the year 2020. Now, don't worry, we have plenty of plans for live streams in the future uh, and next year. And in fact, next week's live stream, I think some of you will be very happy about. Uh, stay tuned for the end of this stream to find out what that topic will be. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just going to kind of wrap up the year. We've done uh, quite a few of these live streams. This is our 54th live stream. Uh, and uh, throughout the year, uh, we've covered a number of space news topics, uh, whether it was just at the beginning of one of our live streams, uh, kind of catching up on current events, or uh, one of our live streams sort of dedicated uh, or connected to a big event happening like the Great Conjunction. Um, but I thought at the end of the year, it'd be kind of fun just to have a little casual live stream and just kind of do a retrospective on all the exciting space news that happened uh, over the course of the past year. So we're just going to kind of touch on some of the highlights that I uh, I pulled together, some interesting things I found interesting. We'll keep it mostly light, light and positive. Wow, Phoebe, very excited to be a part of the stream this week. Um, so we're going to keep it uh, pretty positive uh, with uh, these stories this year. And there, you know, it was a crazy year um, and there were definitely some uh, hard things that uh, a lot of us went through. Uh, but it was a pretty exciting year when it comes to space exploration news and astronomy news. Uh, so hopefully we will uh, have some fun recapping and reminiscing on some of those cool discoveries. Um, <laughs> uh, have I mentioned that my bird is a baby and she's still getting used to things? All right, we got a bunch of shout outs and comments in the comment section already. Vanessa says, hello, happy Monday. This is the last Monday of the year. It is indeed and our last live stream of the year. But like I said, we will continue streaming into next year for the foreseeable future. Uh, one of our longtime watchers, Chris, is saying hello, Patrick. I hope you had a great holiday. Hope you did too, Chris. And that goes for everyone else watching. Hope you've had a wonderful holiday season. If you have time off, hope you're enjoying that. Um, and if you uh, are back at work, uh, whatever that looks like, whether it's uh, at home in pajamas or at an office, um, then I hope that is going well for you all too. Uh, Melinda says hi from Belton. Thanks for tuning in, Melinda. Thanks for watching. Evelyn watching from uh, New Haven, Alaska. Wow, awesome, Evelyn. Thanks so much for watching. Um, I bet it's a little chilly up there as well. BJ says, I never thought about getting a bird. However, I'm liking this. All right, well, uh, you'll s <laughs> maybe watch for a little while longer and see <laughs> how long her good behavior lasts. Uh, birds are great pets, but uh, maybe we'll do a bird stream if I run out of topics to cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Valerie says, a great year for the stars. Indeed, Valerie, a lot of great uh, news and current events. And I'm going to try to switch hands here because I need this one, Phoebe. Thank you. You may return to preening. Um, and uh, yeah, so we are going to jump in. And like I said, we're going to keep this a little casual. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through uh, in chronological order of some exciting things that happened. And right at the beginning of this year, uh, which we did cover a little bit, um, ooh, <laughs> during uh, uh, our first few streams, uh, as it was still a developing news story. Um, but uh, the star Betelgeuse was uh, actually uh, doing some interesting things towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year. It was actually getting quite a bit dimmer. Now, this, is, this was significant because Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star. In fact, we can go over to Space Engine, our other piece of software here, which has the universe in 3D. And we can actually fly to Betelgeuse to see it up close. Uh, now, Betelgeuse was getting dimmer, and Betelgeuse as a supergiant, we think may go supernova in the near future. And so scientists were thinking that perhaps it was getting ready to go supernova, but it did not go supernova, and it actually started to become brighter again, back to its normal brightness. Um, 
So, and, and the reason scientists think it was getting dimmer is if you look at uh, Betelgeuse here, you'll see that these red supergiant stars are not sort of round, uh, nice spherical objects like we imagine stars or like our sun is. They're more of these cloudy blobby uh, shapes that don't really have uniform shapes. Um, and so we think that perhaps it was getting dimmer uh, because of uh, just the changing uh, changing sort of cloud pattern around it. So this is actually a photograph up close of Betelgeuse um, from uh, early, uh, beginning of last year and then uh, late last year slash early this year. And again, it is kind of back to normal. Um, I believe I actually have uh, a chart showing us that. There we go. <laughs> Just getting used to moving windows around. Yeah, as you can see, uh, it got quite a bit dimmer, uh, and then its brightness shot back up to normal levels by around April. So moving right along uh, to, oh, and I wanted to mention too, uh, we have done many of these streams. This is our 54th live stream, which is still blowing my mind. Um, but we've covered a lot of deep dive topics uh, over the course of the year. And if you want to learn more about stellar evolution and why Betelgeuse would go supernova in the near future, then check out our live stream that uh, aired on April 15th. Um, you can check out past recordings of all of our live streams on our YouTube channel. Just search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium, and you can find all those recordings there. So uh, moving right along to February. So uh, we are going to go, uh, do, 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 as Phoebe's chewing on my coat. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, here's, a, here's a good, happy news story that popped up. Um, <laughs> uh oh, where'd my window go? There it is. All right. There it is. We are testing the limits of my multitasking ability. Uh, so uh, a record was set, a pretty exciting space record, uh, when uh, astronaut Christina Koch landed safely on Earth after uh, setting a long duration record for women astronauts. She was in space for a solid 328 days uh, on, on a single mission. And that does set a record for uh, the longest female uh, con uh, continuous space flight. And during her mission, there was also a uh, the first ever all women's uh, spacewalk where all uh, the astronauts in spacesuits performing a spacewalk doing maintenance on the space station were uh, women, which is a historical event as well. Kind of amazing. It took this long for that to happen. Um, but at any rate, her mission was very historic and exciting. All right, let's see. Uh, updates from the uh, InSight Mars lander. Let's get a look at that. Ooh. All right, come here, bird. <laughs> um, so uh, earlier this year in February, NASA announced that some results from the InSight Mars lander, which uh, landed in 2018, uh, has detected some uh, earthquakes, or I should say Mars quakes, uh, on Mars. So the InSight's uh, primary, primary mission is actually to look uh, peer below the surface of Mars to uh, try to figure out what's going on below its surface and see if it is geologically active. And basically, uh, the InSight uh, lander has discovered Mars quakes. So this is challenging our uh, previously thought of perspectives that Mars uh, was is a dead planet that is not very geologically active, but we do have evidence that there are Mars quakes uh, and that uh, it is actually more geologically active than we thought. So uh, March happened, and I think we can all remember uh, what happened around March. Uh, at that time, the planetarium closed to the public, and we reopened in June. As a reminder, the planetarium is open to the public, and if you'd like to support us, of course, watching these live streams and telling your friends and family about them is a great way to support us. Um, but you can also support us if you'd feel comfortable by coming to the planetarium and purchasing a ticket to one of our shows. We are uh, open to the public, like I said, following all of the safe COVID protocols. Um, there goes the bird flying straight into the camera. <laughs> we're, you know, it's, uh, it's we're just going to keep it casual today. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, and like I, like I was saying, you can come visit us at the planetarium. Uh, not Phoebe. <laughs> she definitely uh, can't handle that. Um, but uh, we can handle you if you come to the planetarium. See one of our live star tours. Myself and our other amazing planetarium educators would give a live tour of the night sky in our 60-foot dome theater. So if you do feel comfortable, come check out uh, our planetarium uh, in person because we are open to the public. Uh, so let's fast forward to April. Now, April marked the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope, a historic uh, and very important space observatory. And that has uh, provided some pretty awesome photos uh, for the past 30 years and uh, given us some insights into the history of our universe, peering far back in time, uh, looking at uh, what our universe looked like um, right after its uh, earliest beginning. In fact, um, my uh, 
uh, background, uh, that picture there is the what's called the Hubble Deep Field, which is a photograph of galaxies that are billions of years old. And here's kind of a fun uh, website that uh, NASA put together. Let me pull this up. Um, if you are curious and want to look up uh, the, the photograph that Hubble took on your birthday, if you were born sometime in the last 30 years, uh, then you can uh, go to this uh, NASA website and uh, check that out. And we can post a link to that uh, in the comments section, which I will post there. So we'll post a link if you want to look up a photograph uh, that the Hubble Space Telescope took on your birthday or your kid's birthday. Pretty exciting. Uh, speaking of telescopes, we did a live stream about space telescopes on October 5th, uh, where I took a deep dive into all the different telescopes we have sent to space over the past uh, bunch of decades, past, past half century. And we did take a deep dive into the Hubble. Uh, we can uh, visit the Hubble here in Space Engine as well. Uh, let's go back over to Earth here. Um, we'll just let her chew on that. It's fine. Uh, oh, uh-oh. Where'd Earth go? Um, oh, there's the Hubble Space Telescope. And, ah, there's Earth. <laughs> uh, so that is Hubble still floating around, still taking pictures. Uh, and a successor to the Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope, will hopefully be launched sometime in the near future as well. Uh, check it into the comments section. We got a couple people chiming in. Amber says, hi, Patrick. Happy New Year. Right back at you, Amber. Thanks for watching. And I uh, hope you have a lovely end of your year. Uh, Vanessa says, I had 11 birds, but now I have 10. Uh, well, this one bird, I think, is worth about 20 birds. Um, so uh, just a little FYI. If you're interested in birds, cockatoos are a bit of a handful. Um, Anne is uh, chiming in, says, love these live streams, Patrick. Thanks so much, Anne. I really appreciate it. Uh, hearing from you and everyone else uh, is what keeps me going and definitely uh, is uh, makes these a lot of fun, having all of you chime in and comment. Sarah just uh, commenting, saying, this is my favorite part of Monday. Amazing, Sarah. Guess what? It's my favorite part of Monday, too, especially because you are watching. All right, don't forget, if you have any comments or questions, post them in the comment section, and I will try to answer those live. Uh, let's check back in to our next news story. Ah, going over to May. Um, we have a very exciting uh, event that happened. Oh, my link's not working. There we go. All right. Let me pause this. Uh, so um, the last shuttle mission, space shuttle mission, was in 2011. And since then, NASA has been launching our astronauts aboard uh, Russian spacecraft, uh, which have worked out very well. Um, but very exciting development this year because for the first time in almost a decade, uh, we have sent American astronauts aboard an American rocket. So aboard the uh, SpaceX Dragon capsule, um, the first uh, crewed mission was the Demo-2 mission that launched at the end of May of this year. Uh, and this took two astronauts on a test mission to the International Space Station, so we can see them walking out um, <laughs> right in front of a NASA-themed Tesla, of course, because Elon Musk uh, loves to be extra. And so uh, here they are. This uh, capsule holds four astronauts, but again, this was a test mission, not an official mission. Uh, and uh, you'd be very interested in watching this as well. Um, so a very fancy spacecraft. The uh, seats are powered and reclined, and all of the instruments are touch screens. Uh, now this mission blasted off and was very successful. So successful, in fact, that, well, first of all, the uh, uh, booster stage actually landed back down, as SpaceX often does. Uh, but then the uh, crew capsule made it all the way to the International Space Station, successfully docked, and uh, the astronauts exited. Here they are waving through the capsule. And uh, then they, there they are coming through. So uh, now these astronauts stayed aboard the International Space Station for a few weeks, but uh, this was not an official scientific mission. Um, the official scientific mission uh, took place, uh, there we go, um, a little bit later, which we'll cover in our space news. Um, but anyway, that was very exciting. Uh, and if you want to learn more about uh, that uh, that particular launch, we covered that in our Star Tour and uh, launch coverage live stream on June 1st of uh, this year. Uh, and we also did a live stream uh, very recently, last week actually, uh, or no, two weeks ago, uh, all about orbital mechanics and rocket design. And that was a super fun live stream. It was my longest live stream yet. It was on December 14th. Uh, and uh, we uh, used a very fun uh, computer program called Kerbal Space Program, where we actually built our own rockets and flew them ourselves, which was very silly and a lot of fun. So check out that live stream. Again, that was two weeks ago. You can find all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel, 
Uh, just search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium. Cassandra uh, just commented, uh, says, uh, Walnut Shade, Missouri. I assume that's where you're watching from. Thanks for tuning in, Cassandra. All right, so let's uh, move on to July. Now, July was exciting because there were actually a bunch of Mars missions that happened in July. Uh, there was the Hope Orbiter, which was from the United Arab Emirates uh, Space Agency. Very exciting, an orbiter uh, on its way to Mars. There was the uh, Tianwen-1, which was the first Mars orbiter lander and rover sent by the China National Space Administration. Uh, very exciting, they're getting into space exploration as well. And then potentially most exciting for us, uh, and maybe the world, it was the Perseverance rover uh, launched by NASA, uh, which I will, uh, uh oh, <laughs> try to, oh, no, <laughs> and there we go. We're, uh, it's a bit interesting doing this. Oh, <laughs> Phoebe is very nervous about this. This is very entertaining, actually. Um, all right, so let's switch back over here. Uh, so this is the NASA uh, Perseverance Mars Lander website. They just updated it actually with this really cool animation showing us how the landing will take place. Um, but uh, what do you think about that, Phoebe? She's whoa, she's very nervous about it. Um, I wonder if I can pause that. Uh, oh, I, yeah, it's very scary. Here, let's go. Let's let's put it that way for a second. There we go. It's okay. Um, so uh, so the uh, the Perseverance uh, Mars rover. Uh, was launched in July of this year, uh, and it is uh, the sort of uh, sequel rover to the Curiosity rover, which has been on Mars since 2012. Uh, they're both very similar. Uh, they have six wheels, operate on nuclear power, and drive at a blazingly fast two inches per hour. Uh, and this one is on its way to the Jezero crater on Mars. And also exciting is that Perseverance is carrying with it a helicopter. So we actually will be sending our first aircraft to another planet. Scheduled for landing in February 18th, and we'll be doing live streams then most likely, so we'll definitely cover that exciting mission. But again, you can check out uh, all of that whoop, information about um, uh, the Mars rover um, <laughs> uh, on NASA's website. And uh, you'll have to forgive me for just a moment, folks, because I think my bird just uh, crashed into my bathroom. Uh, so we're going to go on standby for just a second, and I'm going to see if I can go... And if there's any doubt this was live, hopefully that should dispel it. Um, Phoebe was very not happy with the Perseverance rover website, so luckily we have put that away. Hopefully you all are still tuned in uh, to this very this silly live stream. Uh, Rachel says, I love, the or I love the Orbital Mechanics live stream. That's so awesome, Rachel. So glad you watched that and so glad you are tuning back into yet another stream. By the way, speaking of Mars, we did cover Mars in its own live stream on August 8th. So if you want to learn all about the red planet, be sure to check out that uh, recording of our live stream. Um, another cool SpaceX news story is that um, for the first time ever, SpaceX uh, captured a nose cone. Now, for a few years now, SpaceX has been uh, catching uh, or landing its uh, booster stages back on Earth to be able to reuse them, which uh, definitely re extremely reduces the price of sending stuff to space, um, but SpaceX is working on reusing other components of spacecraft like um, fairings, which are coverings for satellites to make them aerodynamic. And SpaceX actually caught both fairings from one of its missions uh, in July of this year. Um, it sent these giant uh, nets out on uh, boats out in the ocean uh, and the fairings parachuted down and then they were caught in these huge nets. So uh, pretty exciting. And again, any way we can reuse uh, different parts um, it re reduces the cost of going to space, which means we can go to space more, which is very exciting. Um, and uh, and the, the main reason is that if we land something in the ocean, even if it's a soft landing, salt water often damages um, uh, rocket components and we'd have to rebuild them and wouldn't be able to reuse them. So very exciting. Uh, another exciting development from SpaceX. Uh, another uh, space exploration uh, exploration news was the Solar Orbiter, a very boringly named orbiter that has been uh, orbiting the sun. Uh, this is a joint NASA and uh, European Space Agency mission. Uh, it captured the closest ever imagery of the sun as it flew by. And this will blow your mind. Uh, now check this out. This is 
video, actual video of the surface of the sun. Uh, so this is actual imagery taken by uh, the uh, solar orbiter there. Uh, the closest ever imagery of the surface of the sun. Pretty crazy. It looks like CGI to me, but that is amazing. Um, I'm not even really sure the scale of this, but you know, probably this is like about the size of of the Earth, just considering how how big the sun is. All right, let's go back over here. Um, moving right along. Let's see. Uh, so, uh, oh, I missed something, didn't I? I did. Shoot. Um, let's uh, go back to uh, the summertime. Uh, well, I guess I was talking about the summertime in July. So June through August, um, this was a really fun uh, space event that you probably heard of, popped up in the news, uh, was the comet Neowise. This was the brightest comet in the Northern Hemisphere since uh, hale -Bopp. Uh, in 1997. We did a live stream all about comets in July, on July 13th, and this was a very uh, silly live stream, um, which uh, we're going to do some live stream -ception here, uh, and uh, I'm just going to show you this live stream where I actually talked about, hey look, it's me, uh, I need a haircut, um, where I talked about comets, uh, and I talked about the uh, comet Neowise, but the coolest thing about this live stream is that we actually changed our scenery, and for uh, the second half of the live stream, I was actually in my living room uh, where I created my own comet out of materials you can buy at a grocery store. So we used some dry ice. Uh, we'll see it uh, steaming here pretty soon. There we go. Mix some dry ice with some other ingredients uh, to form our very own comet. And this is an actual replica of what a comet is like. So if you want to learn how to make your own comet at home with ingredients you can buy at the grocery store, then check out that live stream again. That was on July 13th. That was a pretty fun stream, uh, and we made our own comment. Uh, I'll add that to my resume. <laughs> uh, let's see. Chiming in uh, in the comment section, Stephanie says, this year in review is absolutely flying by, in reference to Phoebe flying, I assume. Yes, it is. Uh, Amber uh, says, is asking, uh, how do they ensure the rocket parts uh, are able to be reused? Uh, potential microscopic weaknesses to the structure? That's a great question, Amber. I um, mean, it's very difficult, as you might imagine. It involves a lot of uh, research and development and it involves um, a lot of iterations. So the current uh, Falcon 9 rocket that SpaceX sends to space is the, uh, they call it Block 5. So it's the fifth, basically, version, uh, kind of like the iPhone 5 of SpaceX rockets. Um, and so they've actually uh, made a lot of improvements to it over time uh, to make it stronger, uh, to uh, and make it, um, you know, better a better lander so it doesn't uh, fail as often. Um, and, uh, you know, whenever they do return uh, one of these rockets, they do obviously take a lot of time to look over it, and they probably check every nut and bolt just to make sure it's fine. Uh, but they don't have to rebuild the whole thing or fix uh, uh, irreplaceable damage like, um, you know, water damage or things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, they're able to uh, uh, ensure that they can reuse most of it uh, just by being very careful and intentional with how they build them uh, to make them modular, to make sure that, um, you know, the parts that they need to check are easily accessible, things like that. But that's a great question, Amber, uh, for sure. So let's uh, continue on. Let's see, where was I? We did, uh, talked about Mars, talked about um, the comet. Uh, Oh, I did skip over this. Uh, back in May, there were some exciting uh, announcements made from the MAVEN orbiter, which has been around Mars for uh, quite a few years. Um, but some really cool uh, data was uh, coalesced and put together uh, into this really neat imagery that was the first ever three-dimensional map of Mars's um, uh, uh, electromagnetic field. So um, let me zoom over here. So this is actual uh, imagery from data collected of uh, Mars's uh, magnetic field. So uh, we can see solar radiation from the sun here uh, interfacing with Mars's magnetic field. And this is sort of showing us the cross section of that. And now it's important to study this uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, if we ever uh, want to go to Mars, then it's going to be very important to understand its magnetic field. Uh, Earth's mag magnetic field protects us um, from harmful so solar radiation. And because Mars is not as volcanically active as Earth is, it has a weaker magnetic field, uh, which means it's a bit more dangerous uh, to hang out on Mars. Another thing is that um, by studying Mars's mag... Oh, I did it again. I always do this. 
I'm sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> I've been showing video of Mars's magnetic field, and you haven't been able to see it, of course. All right. So uh, let us talk about that a little more. So this is imagery of Mars's magnetic field. Okay, I'm double checking. You can see it. Um, and uh, and so because Mars has uh, lost a lot of its magnetic field, we think um, by studying it, we can hopefully understand why it lost its magnetic field, and we can hopefully prevent the Earth from losing its magnetic field sometime in the near future. Um, so pretty cool imagery, and and again, this is data collected over the course of uh, the past decade, but for the first time, kind of coalesced into one. Um, sort of scientific study there. All right. Um, Craig asks, is the International Space Station still leaking? <laughs> that was a news story, Craig, that uh, popped up earlier this year. Uh, there was um, uh, a very small and uh, not uh, too, uh, uh, not too uh, dangerous leak aboard the International Space Station back in October. Um, and for a very brief time, for a few hours, the astronauts excuse me, did go into one of the Soyuz capsules as sort of a lifeboat, um, just to be safe while they diagnosed the problem. Uh, but um, it looks like uh, checking out Space News uh, at the end of October, uh, they apparently were able to plug that leak. Um, and so they were uh, able to fix the leak itself and there was no uh, danger to the crew. Um, and, um, and it looks like, uh, according to this, uh, according to one of the astronauts, they used a, a tea bag uh, to figure out uh, where the leak was. They actually used a tea bag uh, floating in uh, microgravity and watched its flight. Uh, at, basically, the, looked at the air currents pulling it around to help them uh, try to figure out the direction of the leak and its possible source. So, a uh, kind of funny uh, news story there, I guess. Um, uh, you know, astronauts are pretty. Uh, uh, innovative with uh, the different instruments they use for science. So thanks for asking that, Craig. Uh, that is a positive news story that uh, definitely came out of this year. Uh, Rachel says, talking about rocket components, are spacecraft subject to FAA regulations? Um, uh, that's a great question that I uh, don't, off the top of my head, know the answer to. Um, but uh, how do you like that? This is a news story I missed, but uh, there was actually an article posted in March of this year uh, that by the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, saying that uh, they have put into uh, they have enacted new regulations to govern uh, private human spaceflight uh, and uh, crewed uh, spaceflight participants as well. So it looks like uh, that's another news story that popped up this year uh, that uh, I missed out on. Thanks for pointing that out, Rachel. So it does look like uh, here we can um, we can pull that up if you guys want to see. So this is the FAA website. Um, so it looks like they have uh, issued, or so back in May, they issued uh, new regulations establishing requirements for crew and spaceflight participants. Um, so yeah, there you go, pretty interesting. And uh, hopefully that is just paving the way for uh, more human spaceflight and uh, maybe even uh, passenger spaceflight, leisure spaceflight sometime within our lifetimes. That would be very exciting. Somebody is being very bitey right now, Phoebe. All right. So thanks for bringing that up, Rachel. All right, let's move right along through a little bit later in the year. And this is actually a news story that uh, took place over the course of the latter half of the year. Now, SpaceX has been flying its Falcon 9 rocket for quite a while. Uh, and this rocket is amazing at getting into orbit. They also tested a Falcon Heavy variant, which basically strapped three Falcon 9s together uh, to form uh, sort of a supersized rocket. Um, and that was launched uh, in uh, a little while ago, in the previous year. I don't remember if it was last year or the year before. But um, but this year, uh, towards the later half of this year, from August through uh, December through now, SpaceX has been testing out a brand new type of rocket called the Starship. Uh, and the Starship is a much larger rocket. Um, and this rocket is sort of the deep space rocket that they plan on hopefully taking to Mars. Now, um, there was a recent... Uh, Starship test. This was Starship test number eight, uh, and this took place um, just a few weeks ago, uh, I believe. And uh, here is some highlights of that. There we go. Make sure you guys can see. Um, so we can see the Starship here. Uh, it's quite a bit bigger than the Falcon 9, um, and it looks a little more classic with its sort of very shiny appearance. Um, but uh, this was the first high altitude flight. It hasn't gone to orbit yet, but this uh, they're taking it very slow. They're doing um, uh, baby step t tests as it gets higher and higher. 
Um, and then they're testing all the different components. There is rocket vectoring. You saw the engines moving around. Very cool. We talked about that in our orbital mechanics and rocket design live stream as I, that I mentioned two weeks ago. Um, and uh, what the rocket's going to do now is it's going to actually use its uh, control surfaces and its entire body to do a controlled descent. So it's actually going to use its entire surface um, to slow its fall. It's actually going to almost glide down. It looks like a big soda can just plummeting through the sky. And then the very last second, it uh, flips back over 90 degrees and it does what's called a suicide burn where it burns uh, a lot of fuel at the last second to try to land. And the plan will be for the, uh, the Starship to land on uh, either uh, the ground or on an ocean barge um, to be reused, just like the Falcon 9. Uh, now, this mission and test was successful in that the rocket did achieve high, high altitude, but Oh, there you can see it doing its suicide burn. It's so crazy how close to the ground it is when it does that. Um, and uh, well, one of the rockets didn't quite fire enough. And yeah, it wasn't uh, the completely successful mission. Uh, they call that in the rocket industry a RUD, a rapid unplanned disassembly. <laughs> So uh, again, that, uh, that is an ongoing series of tests. Um, the uh, next test, let's see when that is scheduled. Uh, it looks like uh, it's tracking for a New Year, early New Year's launch. Um, it'll be, do, 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 do. when is it scheduled? Who knows, Google is not telling me. Um, sometime soon. Uh, in the new, early next year, it looks like uh, the ninth test uh, will be taking place. Uh, they're doing pre-flight pre -flight preparations tonight, actually. Uh, so maybe it'll be early next year in just the next few days. Pretty exciting. Uh, another test mission. Uh, and maybe that one will have a bit of a softer landing. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, move right along. It's kind of an interesting story. Um, so uh, the Juno spacecraft, which has been orbiting the king of the planets, Jupiter, uh, has uh, captured some pretty interesting imagery uh, recently. And uh, here is a fun little news story that popped up uh, in October. Uh, Juno captured um, some transient luminous events, which are nicknamed sprites um, or ELVs, uh, which stands for <laughs> emission of light and very low frequency perturbations due to electromagnetic pulse sources. Well, try saying that 10 times fast. Um, scientists sure love their acronyms. Uh, but anyway, um, and this phenomenon is actually pretty common on Earth. It occurs about uh, about 60 miles above large thunderstorms. But for the first time, uh, it was imaged on Jupiter. This is uh, a uh, uh, an artist depiction of what it might look like because uh, the imagery uh, captured by the Juno spacecraft is a little bit less exciting. Uh, there's some of the the ultraviolet spectrograph showing uh, the South Pole and some of these transient luminous, luminous events. If you haven't checked out, by the way, um, Juno captures some pretty crazy, uh, amazing uh, imagery of uh, the gas giant planet. Um, oops, how do I go back? I guess I can't go back. Um, <laughs> let me open that up again. All right, there we go. Um, yeah, so Juno's captured some pretty amazing imagery of the gas giant planet. Uh, the Cassini mission, which orbited Saturn for about a decade, captured some amazing and groundbreaking, groundbreaking imagery of uh, Saturn. Uh, but uh, the Juno mission is sort of the sequel to Cassini. It is uh, sh shaping up to be just as groundbreaking, if not more, than Cassini's uh, very long mission. Um, and uh, so here's a quote uh, from uh, one of the Juno planetary, planetary scientists. On Earth, sprites and elves, uh, again, that's what they're, they're called, appear uh, reddish in color due to their interaction with nitrogen in the upper atmosphere of our planet. Um, and, uh, uh, but on Jupiter, the upper atmosphere mostly consists of hydrogen, so they likely appear blue or pink. Like you, Phoebe. <laughs> um, all right, let's move right along. By the way, uh, if you want to learn more about Jupiter, we did a whole live stream about Jupiter way, way back in June. Uh, June 29th was that uh, Jupiter live stream, so be sure to check that one out. 
Ooh, in October also, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to some scientists for their groundbreaking research in black holes. And specifically, uh, uh, this was a, a three-part award, so it was awarded to three different scientists, and two of them uh, actually were responsible for this imagery. Uh, this is imagery of the center of our galaxy. Now, um, there, those dots are stars that are moving so rapidly at the center of our galaxy that we've been able to plot their paths. And by plotting their motions, we can calculate their mass and their velocities. And we can also calculate the mass of whatever object they're orbiting. Now, the interesting thing is that when scientists first looked towards this object, they didn't see anything there. But uh, thanks to the scientists that did win the Nobel Prize this year, we do know that that object at the center, center of our galaxy is a supermassive black hole. It's named Sagittarius A star. It appears towards the constellation Sagittarius. Um, and A star is A asterisk. Um, but uh, uh, pretty incredible stuff and exciting that uh, the physics prize was awarded to this uh, black hole discovery. Now, if you want to learn more about black holes, we do cover them in our Stellar Evolution live stream. Uh, and I can show you uh, of one black hole real quick here in Space Engine. Looks like Hubble's on the nighttime side now. Uh, let's go to Sagittarius A star. BB's very excited about that. Whoa! There it is. Uh, now, in Space Engine, we can plot the orbits of uh, the orbital paths of elements that are orbiting this object. Let's zoom out here a little bit more. So this is in 3D, those stars that are orbiting the supermassive black hole. Now, um, these stars orbit so close to this object, you can see one gets extremely close to it, uh, that we know that this object must be small enough, uh, of course, for these stars to go around it. But we also know uh, how heavy this object is. And basically, based on how heavy the object is, uh, and how small it must be, we know that it must be a supermassive black hole. Um, so uh, it is very, very bright and luminous. This black hole is about 4 million times the mass of our sun. But it's pretty crazy just by looking at uh, the motion of stars out in our galaxy, we can actually uh, discover things that we can't even see, which is pretty incredible. Speaking of which, uh, another exciting discovery this year was that uh, researchers confirmed that the closest black hole to Earth ever discovered is only 1,000 light years away. So hopefully we won't get sucked into that one anytime soon. I think we'll, we're probably safe from it. Let's chime back into the comments. We're uh, getting close to the end of the year and the end of our live stream. So if you have any other comments or questions, be sure to post them in the stream. And I or Phoebe will try to answer them. Uh, Tammy, one of our longtime watchers, is chiming in saying, Hello from Iowa. Thank you for still doing these. Tammy, thank you for still watching these. You've been one of our biggest supports. Uh, and we really appreciate you uh, watching and commenting. Uh, and uh, we hope you continue watching for quite some time. And we hope we can continue doing these streams for a while as well. Um, so thanks for watching, Tammy. All right, so we're going to move along to uh, later in October. Oh, another news story I wanted to bring up uh, is that NASA announced uh, some new discoveries uh, from uh, SOFIA, which is a pretty cool uh, observatory. SOFIA is actually an airplane observatory. It's the only one of its kind, um, the uh, only flying observatory, basically. Uh, and uh, NASA here announced in October that it discovered um, that there is water on the moon. Now we knew there was water on the moon. It was, uh, we knew that there was uh, frozen water in some of the uh, dark craters that stay covered in darkness uh, uh, permanently, but the SOFIA uh, aircraft here, there it is, um, there is SOFIA, it uh, actually discovered water on the daytime side of the moon. Now the reason that's interesting is because on the daytime side of the moon it gets very hot over the boiling temperature of water. So the fact that there is any water on there at all um, really is, is very interesting and kind of uh, changes our notions of the moon. We used to think that all water must evaporate on the moon uh, because it is so hot in the daytime. Um, but that is clearly not the case. Uh, now, uh, this water is about one one hundredth of the amount of water that's found in the Sahara Desert. So it's a very tiny amount, uh, but still it is important um, because if we do ever go to, uh, or we are planning on going back to the moon uh, for that matter, but when we do get back to the moon, uh, having water already on the moon will help astronauts a lot because otherwise we'd have to bring all the water we want with us. But if there's water already on the moon, uh, then perhaps we could find a way to uh, capture that water and uh, use it uh, for ourselves. So let's go back over here. Oh, and by the way, if you want to learn more about the moon, we did a stream all about Earth's moon. That was on uh, November 30th, so check out that live stream. If you want to learn just about moons in general, I did my top 10 moons in the solar system on September 14th. Um, 
So again, uh, we are approaching the end. Just a couple more news stories I want to talk about. Ooh, uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, which stands for Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, and Security Regolith Explorer. Another mouthful. Um, it was a probe that went to an asteroid, the asteroid Bennu, uh, and it uh, actually captured a sample from the surface of this asteroid. Now it's going to take a while to get back to us. It's scheduled to return the sample to Earth on in the year 2023, um, but still very cool that we have actually uh, gotten a sample from an asteroid, and that is on its way back here. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that's not the only. That's the that's a, a NASA mission that's returning. Uh, samples, but actually this month the Japanese Space uh, Agency uh, just uh, picked up its Hayabusa 2 uh, uh, capsule, which is a probe that went to the asteroid called Ryugu, uh, and it returned samples as well. So the uh, scientists are actually already studying those samples. So we already have samples from an asteroid back here on Earth, and there will be another sample mission coming in 2023. And if you want to learn more about asteroids and other uh, objects in that category, they're called minor planets. We did a live stream on November 9th all about minor planets, asteroids, and such things like that. All right, so in November, uh, the SpaceX Crew-1 mission took place, uh, and that was the first official uh, crewed mission aboard the SpaceX Dragon capsule. There were four astronauts aboard that mission, uh, and so that marked the beginning of the official uh, missions that uh, NASA is sending our astronauts aboard, our own American-made rockets uh, once again. So very exciting. Uh, and then the International Space Station celebrated its 20th birthday. Uh, its 20th, well, not birthday, really. It's 20th anniversary of humans being aboard it. Uh, and that was in November, like I said, and we celebrated uh, this year uh, on October 19th during our live stream that night, uh, talking about the International Space Station. Uh, so uh, this was a fun stream because uh, during this stream, uh, we actually built the International Space Station out of Legos. Uh, so this was a super fun stream, and we put it together piece by piece, talking about each module and their history and um, how uh, they work and what they do, and we put it together in order. So if you want to learn about the process that it took to put together the International Space Station, be sure to check out that live stream. Again, that was on October 19th, and that was a super fun and silly live stream. Uh, now, the International Space Station's mission is currently scheduled to uh, continue through 2024, uh, but it's pretty likely that they'll extend that another four years through 2028 because it's uh, still being very successful. And despite uh, a few very minor and safe leaks, uh, by all accounts, uh, that uh, space station is still serving us very well. Now, wrapping up the year, this month there have been a number of news stories, some a uh, little less exciting and sad. Uh, for example, at the beginning of this month, we did mark uh, a very sad, uh, sad uh, uh, point uh, in the story of one of the most iconic space telescopes, the Arecibo Observatory, a giant radio telescope um, that uh, in, in a giant radio telescope in Puerto Rico that unfortunately collapsed. Uh, this is a very old radio telescope um, that is uh, that unfortunately uh, there was a structural failure and part of it collapsed, and it is a uh, pretty uh, irreparable. There's actually uh, a video of the collapse captured by a drone. Um, oop, and there we go. Of course, I was on the wrong section. Uh, so again, the Arecibo Observatory uh, did unfortunately collapse. Uh, and so here is a video. Or if I can zoom in, I'll try to go full screen. Yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, we can see the cable snapping and a very, very sad sight. Uh, seeing this observatory uh, collapse. This, was, this observatory um, was uh, instrumental in a lot of discoveries about our universe, and it also helped uh, to uh, identify near-Earth objects, asteroids that get close to the planet. So it def it's, uh, its loss will definitely be felt in the astronomical community, uh, and also, um, you know, just for, uh, you know, safety, uh, tracking asteroids as they get close to Earth. So hopefully there will be fewer uh, future missions uh, that will uh, take up uh, Arecibo's uh, mantle and uh, continue its mission. Also, Arecibo very famously uh, sending a message out into space uh, called the Arecibo message. Uh, let's uh, take a look at that um, message. Do, 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 do. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Uh, da, da, da. There we go. There's the message. Uh, so this was a message that was actually uh, uh, designed uh, in part with uh, by uh, Carl Sagan, uh, and it involves a number of different uh, 
a number of different uh, uh, pieces and uh, notes that are sent to extraterrestrials. So first of all, it has uh, a number system in binary that uh, is just sort of, uh, you know, the introduction saying, hello, we are intelligent life. And then I believe these are some uh, uh, compound molecules or amino acids, something like that. This is uh, supposed to be a picture of the Arecibo telescope. Uh, oh, this one down here is the Arecibo telescope, rather. Uh, and then a picture of a person and a satellite and uh, the solar system here with our location uh, being right there. So a very simple message uh, meant to be transmitted uh, in very simple, uh, you know, beats, ones and zeros binary, as it were. Um, but uh, that message, unfortunately, will uh, have stopped after the Arecibo telescope is no more. Uh, but again, there are future telescopes uh, in the works that hopefully will pick up its mantle. Uh, a, a happier bit of news, uh, China's uh, Chang uh, 5 capsule landed on Earth this month uh, with the first lunar samples to be returned to Earth in 44 years since the Apollo program. Uh, and again, you can learn more about the moon uh, during our uh, end of November live stream, November 30th, uh, where we actually talked about that a little bit. Uh, and uh, finally, the final bit of news, and as a reminder, post your final comments and questions in the comments section. Uh, but the final bit of news we will cover is that this month, uh, NASA announced its Artemis team. So the Artemis program is NASA's program to return to the moon uh, and potentially go beyond the moon, maybe going to Mars. Uh, but right now, we are scheduled to go back to the moon in 2024. Uh, sending the first woman and next man to walk on the lunar surface. And so they announced the team of astronauts here. There's a there's a sizzle reel, of course, um, where uh, NASA wants uh, being an astronaut to look as cool as possible, as if it needed to look any cooler. Oop, there we go. Uh, as I said, there's a sizzle reel of some of the astronauts working on space stuff. Um, and uh, da -da -da -da. so here are some of the astronauts going to the moon. Again, the Artemis program is currently in development and we will hopefully be going back to the moon uh, in the year 2024 uh, and uh, that will be landing on the moon. So look in the next few years to missions to the moon, going around the moon and testing things out like the Apollo program did. Um, but uh, very exciting. So there's uh, some pictures of the astronauts, a great looking crew of 20 astronauts who will be going back to the moon. They haven't announced specifically which ones will get to walk on the moon first. But I imagine that will be a quite the game of drawing straws. So very exciting 2024. Stay tuned for that. Uh, and that wraps up some of the most exciting news stories, I think, that happened in the world of space and astronomy. Uh, let us wrap up our stream by checking out the comment section. Carol says, I've enjoyed uh, this during this trying year. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carol, for watching. And uh, your support has definitely helped me uh, in this trying year as well. Uh, and... Uh, and it, this has been a lot of fun uh, getting to do these, and I look forward to continuing them next year as the world slowly gets back to something uh, resembling normal. Evelyn says, thanks for the stream. Thanks for watching, Evelyn. Gretchen says, fascinating. Thank you for sharing these details. Of course, Gretchen, thanks for watching. Um, Emily says, a pretty bird. Thank you. Do you hear that, Phoebe? You're pretty. Yeah, she knows it. Um, Linda says, I love those. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Linda. I appreciate you watching. Rachel says, I loved the ISS live stream too. Super engaging. That's awesome, Rachel. So glad you've checked out our other streams before. And again, don't forget, you can watch uh, uh, everyone else who hasn't. You can watch all of our uh, previous live streams. Just search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium uh, on YouTube. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page where we post exciting space updates all the time. And we also do our live streams there. So be sure to drop us a like there. That supports us a lot. Uh, and Craig says, when I was in middle school, we got moon rocks. I was expecting rocks, but it was basically dust in acrylic. Uh, yeah, well, um, so uh, we brought back uh, about 400 pounds, uh, I believe around 400 pounds, uh, maybe more of uh, moon rocks and dust uh, during the Apollo mission. Uh, but as you can imagine, they are very rare and prized commodities. So um, the bits that are available to the public are uh, few and far between and very small. And uh, some of those rocks and soil samples uh, might have been regolith, which is the name of the dust uh, on the surface of the moon. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, a whole moon rock may be cool, but um, it was still cool to get to see something from the moon. And another cool thing is that we actually have uh, other objects from other planets here on Earth. There are actually some uh, meteorites that we've tracked back to Mars that you can actually see. Um, I don't have any. We don't have any at the planetarium, uh, but you can find those. Um, and then uh, last comment coming in from Chris. 
Thank you for another great show, and thank you, Chris, and everyone else who has watched this live stream. We are so thankful for your support uh, over the past year, uh, and uh, to everyone who's come to the Planetarium to see one of our live shows uh, or one of our uh, documentary features or kids' shows, I want to thank you genuinely for supporting us because I know that it's been a, a very troubling year, and I know that um, a lot of people uh, may have not felt comfortable um, coming out to see us, and that is, of course, okay. And to anyone who has not been able to come visit us, uh, I want to uh, say thank you for continuing to support us in our live streams. That has meant the world to us as well and more, and, and no hard feelings. We are very excited for the day that you do feel comfortable coming out back to the planetarium, and until that day, we will see you right back here uh, next week, next Monday, for our first 2021 live stream, uh, because, of course, we know as soon as the new year rolls around, everything will change in Instantly. Uh, that live stream will be very exciting because we are going to be covering a topic that has been demanded by the public. Everyone's favorite, not a planet, everyone's favorite former planet, the biggest and coolest dwarf planet, Pluto. We're going to do our first uh, live stream in our, uh, about Pluto and we'll do our final live stream about the solar system. We have covered everything in our solar system by this point. We've covered all the planets. We've covered uh, the sun and stellar evolution. We've covered uh, many of the moons. I did top, my top 10 moon live stream. We've covered the moons of the planets we've visited. We've talked about Earth's moon. We've talked about um, minor planets like dwarf planets and asteroids. And we've talked about comets. We've covered just about everything you can imagine in our solar system except for Pluto. So next Monday, we will be covering Pluto, the final and former planet, the final stop on our solar system tour, I should say, uh, and the final former planet. So be sure to check that out. 6 p.m., same place, same virtual planetarium. Uh, we will see you then. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful end of the year. Happy New Year, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed your holiday season, and we'll see you back next week. I have been your planetarium specialist, Patrick Hess. This has been my assistant, Phoebe, who has uh, been very chill for the end of the stream. So uh, thank you so much, Phoebe. Do you want to you give a kiss to the audience? Oh, she's, what was that, feather? Here, give everyone a kiss. Nope, she's not going to do it. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great week. Happy New Year, and we'll see you next time. Bye.